Hi everyone, we are talking about event driven services now and as you can see we have a microservice architecture. So S1, S0, S2, S3 and S4 are the services we have. We have a client connected to S1, it sends a request. After S1 has processed this request and made some changes if required, it needs to send two messages to S0 and S2. The important thing to notice here is that the order of these two messages don't matter. S2 can get the message first or S0 can get it first. Similarly, S3 and S4 need to get messages from S2 after it's done its processing. And the order of these two messages don't matter either. If you're using a request response architecture, you'll be sending a request to S2 and a request to S0. The smart thing to do is to send these requests asynchronously and wait for the responses. Once they have sent a successful response, you just do the same thing with S2. The main drawback with this architecture if you're using requests and responses is that S2 might be waiting for both of these services to complete. Even if it is asynchronous, it might wait for S3 and S4's response to come. Once it gets a response, it's going to send it to S1 and then send it to the client. Imagine if S4 fails. If S4 fails, then S2 is going to be waiting for it. After a timeout, it's going to send a timeout to S1, which in turn is going to send a timeout to this client. And it took a long time for this request to fail. Not just that, S1 actually processed it correctly. So this data now might be stale, right? So when the request is sent again, S1 is going to make a change in the database again, and then S2 is going to get the same request. It might make a change in its database. There are two places where there might be multiple changes uh, for the same request. The better way to handle this is something called a publisher subscriber model. With the publisher subscriber model, what we can do is we can remove this kind of dependency on the request and response and make it pass a message. Right? Messages are fire and forget. So if I send a message here to a message broker like Kafka, like RabbitMQ and depend on it to correctly send the message to S2. So it's probably going to persist some messages and abstract out a lot of things. Um, now S1 can actually send a success to the cell phone, right, to the client. Kafka, the message broker, is going to be waiting till S2 is back up and then send the message. Similarly, instead of S2 sending the message to both its clients, it's going to pass it to a message broker in between. And this message broker is going to take up the responsibility once it's completed to send these two messages to S3 and S4. One thing I forgot here is that uh, the message broker is going to be sending this message also. So this request response is taken out of S1. There are some advantages and disadvantages with this architecture. Let's start with the ad advantages. Uh, the first one is that this is going to decouple a lot of the responsibilities that you had. So S1 is no longer dependent on S2 and S0. Instead, it just publishes to the message broker and then it's relieved. So its responsibilities are over. It sends a message to the client saying that I'm successful. Client says, okay, till both the messages are sent to S0 and S, S2, this message broker is going to be persisting those messages. Let's say S2 is down uh, and once it comes back up, that time the message broker is going to replay those messages to S2 so that it can then send it to S3 and S4 using this message broker. Uh, the best thing about this is that it makes the system easier to understand. Instead of having multiple points of failure, it's got a single point of failure, which is far more easy to deal with. Um, one good thing about that again is that if you are having a single point where you're sending messages, you just need to have one interface. So S1, this is a developer thing. Uh, if S1 is going to be sending a message to the message broker, it sends a generic message with a lot of data. The message broker then sends generic messages to S2 and S0, which in turn consume that information and then according to their requirement, take data. So. That's a, that's a good thing for the developers. They don't need to worry about what is the interface interactions that they have with these two messages. Um, this also provides you some sort of transaction guarantees, right? So if you're sending a message to S1 and it's able to persist to the message broker, that means that the message will somehow reach S3 at some point of time in the future because this message broker is not going to lose messages. It has some persistence in it. It's going to ensure that S2 gets a message. Similarly, this message broker is not going to 
uh, lose its messages. So S3 and S4 are ensured to get the messages. So if you send this request once and you get a success, it means that this, this process will terminate at some point of time in the future. So that's a loose transaction guarantee of at least once. And it's also more scalable because if you have a new service S6, which is interested in S1's messages, all you need to do is register this service S6 with the message broker and then it sends the messages uh, being produced by S1 to S6 also, right? S1 did not need to know the, the subscribers for its messages. So there's a lot of things which are standard publisher subscriber advantages which we have just found over here. Talking about the disadvantages of this service, let's get to a financial system which requires a lot of consistency. Um, let's say you have an invoice generator and you have a fund transfer service uh, and S1 is a gateway. So the gateway does nothing, it just processes the message and then sends it to S2 and S1. I mean S0 and S2. So you get a request from the client saying that please transfer my funds from account A to account B. And the amount that I want to transfer is 950. The initial uh, amount in account A is 1000. So the bank is going to charge 50 rupees for this transaction as a commission. So after this transaction, A should have zero rupees in its account and B should have 950 in it. That's the expectation. But let's say the gateway gets the message, forwards it to S2 and S0. S0 says remove 50 rupees from the account because that's my commission and sends an email to the client saying that, you know what, you have 950 rupees in your account or rather it just sends an email saying that this is the transaction amount that you asked for. So 50 rupee deduction that makes 1000 minus 50, 950, right? This is the current amount in the, in the account. And the fund transfer service is down, which means the message broker is not able to send those messages to S2. Nothing has happened yet. It's still at 950. The client then sends another request saying that, you know what, transfer 800 rupees. So 800 rupees means a, a commission of 50 rupees. So in total, 850 rupees needs to be in your account. The message comes to S1, sends it to S2 and S0. S0 picks up the message, sees that the account currently has 950. You need 850 for this transaction to be successful. And so no problem deducting 50 rupees from the total that you have right now, which is 950 minus 50, which is 900, is your current balance. And the fund transfer got two requests of 950 and 800. When the fund transfer runs, what's going to happen is that it got a request for 950 transaction. That is going to fail. Okay, that's going to fail because the current funds you have is 900, 950 is beyond that. The first transaction fails. The second transaction of 800 succeeds, leaving 900 minus 800, 100 rupees in the account. Okay, with 100 rupees in the account, the initial expectation was there's going to be zero rupees left. That should have happened. The second transaction should have failed. Instead, you have 100 remaining. You have 800 transferred and 100 rupees as commission to the bank. So there's a lot of confusion because of having a transaction across services, right? All this could have been avoided had you not had a transaction across services. Um, and there are ways that you can avoid this. Uh, which we'll be discussing in the next session on consistency. But this is a major drawback of this kind of architecture. You can't use it for um, mission critical systems where either there's a success or a failure, like there's no atomicity in this. The other drawback about this is that it doesn't guarantee anything about item potency. So um, you send the message from here, you give it to S2, S2 makes a change in its internal state. And if S2 is doing something which is not item important, let's say withdrawing 50 rupees from, a, from an account, uh, S2 is going to do that. And when publishing over here to this broker, it might fail. So it sends a failure response over here. Uh, after the message is replayed, it might debit 50 more rupees from here and then send the message again. So you're seeing a similar kind of issue where 50 rupees are removed multiple times because this message that the message broker is sending is not item important. It's asking you to debit 50 rupees 
Instead, it should be also sending a request ID along with it. So if the same request ID comes along and you have made a database change according to that request ID, you can ignore it, right? But this is something that the developers need to do. So that is application logic, and this architecture in general is not helping you do that. At this point, we understand how publisher subscriber models work, uh, and that's the basis for event-driven services. So because of publisher subscriber models, you can architect a lot of complex systems, but be aware of its advantages and disadvantages. It can't be used in the finance service, but it can definitely be used for, let's say, gaming services, where you have a lot of analytics being done, or you're going to be sending events which have occurred. So you're going to be publishing events, and then you have subscribers for those events. One of the major organizations which uses this architecture is Twitter. So for that business requirement of posting a tweet and many people actually consuming that tweet, the publisher subscriber model is perfect, right? You have events published and subscribers for that. Uh, and this is the basis for event-driven services. I'll be taking event-driven services in the next video because this is pretty lengthy anyway. Um, if you have any discussion you want to do on this architecture, we can have them in the comments below. Uh, I'll see you next time then.